Network to the world. Subscribe now to the Hot 97 YouTube channel. It's Ebro in the Morning with Laura Stiles and Rosenberg. It's Ebro, it's Laura and Rosenberg. Welcoming to our program today. We want, if you don't know him, uh, he's heavy on socials, representing Canada. His name is Jack Meat Singh. How you doing, sir? Very well, sir. Great to meet you all. Shout out to everybody. Love. I said this already, but one more time, congratulations to Laura on the new baby. It's an amazing experience. Uh, I'm only feeling it through my brother and his partner, but I know it's beautiful. Yes, thank you so much. I mean, you, there's a lot of political stuff that uh, we're going to get into uh, with regard to moves you've helped make in Canada. But the real reason you're on the program is because your beard is better than mine. <laughs> oh, shoot. I was going to say, it's nice to have a fellow beard brother. You know, I can relate. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's what we really wanted to talk about on this, on this uh, segment was beard products. And what do you use? Right, right. You know, I don't use too much, man. I got a, you know, we rock a comb uh, in, I, I got like a bun here, a top knot. I rock a comb in that. Kind of uh -huh. like a pick, actually, in a way. Yeah. And that's the comb I use, like a wooden comb, like nice quality. And I use that to comb the beard out. And I don't really do too much else. Like once in a, a while. A wood comb like this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But smaller a little bit. I got yeah, yeah, yeah. in my hair right now. But yeah, that, yeah. I have that up in my, in my, in my turban, in, in my top knot. And then, you know, when I comb in the mornings and night, I use that wooden comb. I believe in that, the power of wood. It's a very interesting beard, too, because most people go gray on the bottom like Ebro. Right. But yours his is gray is... in the middle. I know he has a spotlight. It's because he's spitting Yo. so much wisdom from his mouth. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He got wow. the gray around the mouth because he's dropping gems out here. Oh, snap. That's, I appreciate I'm going to use that uh, when, my wife, when my wife makes fun of me for having this, this streak right here. But, yeah, it's all good. So, Jagmeet, <laughs> um, what, what is your role right now in Canada? Sure. So I am I'm the leader of the, the third largest political party in the country. It's the New Democratic Party. We are known as the party that's fighting for social justice and fairness. And, and I lead the party. I also represent a riding uh, as a member of parliament, which is a lot like, uh, like a congressman and congressperson. And I represent a riding in uh, just by Vancouver called Burnaby. And and so you, um, as the leader of this new Democratic Party, your origin, though, comes from the Toronto area, right? You're out of that. Um, that's how you kind of came to be known politically from that area. Absolutely. Yeah. So I, I, I was born in Toronto, uh, Scarborough specifically, but born in Toronto and then lived kind of all over Canada. There's a, a place called Newfoundland, Labrador, which is like an island and then a, a part of the mainland that's quite far north. I lived there for a bit, lived in Windsor. But uh, my political kind of background where I was first elected was in the in the greater Toronto area. So that's that's the area that I that I kind of built up and, and was well known in. And in Newfoundland and Labrador, I'm sure people ask this question all the time. Are there just amazing dogs running around everywhere? It's a like, great point. <laughs> like I've always <laughs> wondered. I've never been, but I'm like, yo, do you just show up and there's just these because I, I love a Labrador. Right, I can't oh, right. lie, and I like a Newfoundland too. Like those okay. are amazing dogs. I just want to know if they just roam free. They, you know, they don't. I, I, I wish I could say missed yeah, opportunity, it was just the land of missed, the, missed the tourism dogs. opportunity right there. <laughs> it, it is actually a beautiful place. Like shout outs to folks who want to go somewhere a bit different, off the beaten track. Newfoundland is is hella cool, very very beautiful, very different. Uh, you can hike up anywhere, and if you get a little bit of inclination, if you get up a little bit of height. There are just wild blueberries everywhere. So really? there is oh, like wow. not Newfoundland and Labradors, but there are wild blueberries like kids to make extra money. Just like hike up a bit of a hill and there's like unlimited wild blueberries. They pick them into buckets and go sell them because there's just like everywhere. But the That's dogs kind of are named after these areas, though. They That's are. A they fact. are. Absolutely. Absolutely. They are. Yes. Um, so <laughs> um, we um, connected with you today because you uh i saw you tweet out that um you guys were able to do something that america once again has not been able to do which is officially make the proud boys a terrorist organization in canada um can you talk us through uh how that got done uh who was who was the opposition to it and and just where things were at absolutely so we saw what happened in the states and we all looked at horror at what went down and a couple of things came to mind we realized that what had been happening and and it's not just in the states in, in canada as well is the real and urgent threats to people's security and safety were being ignored because of systemic racism and, and i want to point that out because the the white extremists are uh, the white supremacists and the extreme right-wing groups 
that were that were that that attacked the Capitol, that were part of that insurrection, weren't hiding it. They put it out there. They said we were going to do this, but they were ignored. And why were they ignored? Why was that real threat ignored? I, I want to say it's because uh, systemic racism led to saying, oh, they're white supremacists, they're extreme right wing groups. They're not a real threat. We're not worried about them. But they actually ended up killing people, tried to undermine democracy. So similarly in this in Canada, we looked at the real and urgent threats from white supremacists, from extreme right wing groups are being ignored and they are dangerous and they are the real threats. And, and so the question came up in a legit question. So we we pushed for this. I got a petition going and built a lot of movement. We got hundreds and thousands of signatures and we put this forward in Parliament. I put a motion forward. I read out the motion. I said, we're calling on the government to name this group. As, uh, as a terrorist group to name the Proud Boys, to designate them a terrorist group. And in addition, to make sure we're tackling white supremacy and extreme right wing groups that are the real threats. The motion got passed and then we put pressure and the, and the country finally banned them. But I want to point out something. The, the, the journalists have asked me questions saying, well, isn't this dangerous for a politician to basically put forward motions to get a certain group banned? And I said, yeah, that's not how things should happen normally. Normally it should be the evidence is evaluated by the experts. They look at the evidence and then make a decision. But what if the experts are ignoring the evidence because of systemic racism, because they don't think white supremacists and extreme right wing groups are a threat when they really are? That's why this motion was super important, because it says, let's put our resources towards the real threats that keep on getting ignored. Well, I know here in the States, one of the biggest problems is the fact that the air and I'm using air quotes, the experts, uh, the police, uh, oftentimes uh, law enforcement, and even when you go up the ladder in society, whether it be lawyers and doctors and bankers and et cetera, et cetera, they also ignore the threats of white supremacy and extremist groups that are uh, Nazi or white supremacists. And oftentimes it's because, like you pointed out, the systemic racism, when applied, it's because they are them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there is something about that. I mean, I, I laugh because it, 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 it just kind of like the absurdity of it. But yeah, like just because um, people in decision making, the experts and maybe broader society looks at white supremacy and think, oh, that's not that's that's not that scary. But we look at that and say, that's scary. man. these are the these are the folks that are pushing anti-Semitism. These are the folks that are pushing you know, uh, anti-black racism. These are the folks that are pushing all sorts of xenophobia. They're dangerous. They're promoting hate. They're promoting violence. I look at those groups and say, that's scary. But for some reason, the, the experts have looked at it and then, OK, it's not that big a deal. Let's focus our attention somewhere else. But here's the thing. When you focus your attention somewhere else and you ignore the real and present and urgent dangers, people's lives are at stake. There is a cost to that. And that's why we always say systemic racism actually makes everyone's life worse off because when you're targeting and policing the wrong groups because of your own bias, it means that resources aren't spent to properly take care of people and keep people safe and people pay the price. And in this case, in Washington, D.C., we saw the toll of what happens when you don't take these threats seriously. So what does like I know this is a very broad question. But what does white supremacy and, and racism, anti-immigrant racism, anti-black racism, Afro-Canadian, whatever it may be, what does that feel like in Canada, which it does not have the same horrible history that the United States has, but obviously racism still exists? Right. What, do you, what do you see as sort of the differences in how it manifests itself? You know, not really uh, that different. We don't have the same history, but it is just the same um, hateful energy, and it still exists in a real way. Uh, we see different outcomes when it comes to education, incarceration rates. Uh, they're far higher for people who are racialized. If you're black or brown, you're more likely to get arrested, to get beat up by the police, to, be, to spend time in custody, to not get bail. Uh, and if you compare those numbers directly to someone who's not black or brown, the rates are completely different. Uh, when it comes to positions of power, same thing. You know, if you look at CEOs, heads of even schools, principals, teachers, the same things apply. Uh, we had really horrible examples after what happened to George Floyd in Canada, where racialized people who were uh, their families called the police because they needed help and they had mental health concerns. 
We had unarmed racialized people be killed in their own home. And then on the flip side, there was a, a white man who drove up to the prime minister's residence with, with his truck, rammed the gates, had multiple firearms with him, and he was peacefully talked down and arrested without of any course. violence. Of course. Uh, de escalated. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, like, I mean. So it's the same. Happened. It's the same. <laughs> Same, same. Well, People it's the same. Like, it's just that Canada didn't have, well, Jim Crow in the way that we had Jim Crow here in North America. But it, it is also very uh, true that the way the First Nations people have been treated by the education system in Canada has been a complete atrocity. Oh, I really appreciate you brought that up, uh, Ebro. It is, uh, we had this uh, residential school system, and the residential school system was openly, like they didn't even try to hide this. The whole goal of it was to commit a genocide. It was to take indigenous kids from their families, make them lose their language, make them lose their culture, their teachings, strip them from everything that made them who they are. And they received, in many cases, abuse and violence in these schools. They were forcibly taken from their families. And to this day, that legacy of residential school still is a big part of why there's so much trauma in the indigenous communities. Uh, yeah, it's 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 horrible. Uh, many international groups have looked at that and said that is one of the the worst human rights violations against a community that they've seen. It, it is it is the impact is colossal, and uh, the the level of human rights violations is staggering. I often remind people: don't let the fact that Canadians apologize frequently and say sorry, <laughs> sorry about everything fool you. They were up there. Yeah. They were up there doing some very dangerous. Uh, purposefully malicious things to brown folks, First Nations people, and black people when black people arrived during the Great Migration and before that, too. For sure. I mean, we've got some good history around um, the, the, the Underground Railroad and, and some support for, for folks that made it to, to Canada uh, on a positive side. But let's not, let's not get that kind of romantic vision that Canada has no systemic racism. Those same uh, freed slaves that did make it to Canada also faced a lot of systemic racism at the same time. So it maybe wasn't slavery, but it was certainly very difficult. And looking at all the history, there's been serious problems in Canada as well. So we've got our, our own issues we got to deal with. What have you dealt with as a public figure, uh, an elected politician, uh, and a man that wears a, a turban and comes from your uh, background? What have you personally dealt with uh, hearing from people? Oh, lots of stuff. Uh, a lot of it kind of made made a bit of uh, big news. One of the first incidents kind of went viral around the world where I was at a, at a rally and and uh, someone came up to me to interrupt the rally, attacked me and said, uh, you're a terrorist and, and you're associated with the Muslim Brotherhood and just kind of went off. And and I always have this belief, you know, if I never respond to someone who is Islamophobic or coming at me and attacking me for being a Muslim by saying I'm not a Muslim, because I would suggest it would be OK if I wasn't or if I was. Uh, and, and so I've always responded by saying, like, we've got to tackle hate. But in that case, I responded. I mean, I'm someone who has legal training. I was a lawyer. I've been a politician, got martial arts training. I, I competed a lot. So I wasn't ever worried about my safety. I, I responded by saying, you know what? Something in that person reminded me of, of someone who just felt pain or was hurt. Something went, went wrong in their life and they were just lashing out. So uh, the moment kind of got shared a lot because I said, you know, in case, I mean, maybe this person needs to hear it. Like, I care about you. I love you. You know, like in the, everyone in this room loves you. Uh, we're about love and we're about courage and we're about taking care of each other. And uh, that moment went off and went viral because I think that was a different response. I'm not saying everyone should do that. If someone's aggressively attacking you and being racist towards you, that is not necessarily the only response. For me, in my position, I could do that. And, and that's something that happened. Uh, I've received lots of threats of violence. Uh, police have had to investigate, but I knew what I was getting into and I'm prepared for it, but it shouldn't be that way. It shouldn't be that if you raise concerns that you, you face uh, these type of challenges, but it reminds me like I'm not alone just because I, I have a turban and a beard. I face this, but women face this all the time when they, when they rise up and they speak truth to power, women are also faced with massive misogyny mm -hmm. and threats of violence. Uh, racialized people in general see this all the time. So I just get a little bit of what people go through because I experience it as well. Well, his name is Jagmeet Singh. I'm sure we're going to be seeing a lot more from you. Uh, the New Democratic Party is considered very progressive, yes? 
yeah, in, in the spectrum, right. even though it's it's always interesting, right? Something is categorized as so progressive just because they are attempting to uh, move people forward into a more enlightening, uh, enlightened, inclusive kind of uh, fashion. Uh, but it becomes politicized. It's it's very interesting because um, even here yeah. in America, like you hear some of the progressive ideas and while you might be like, OK, it's progressive because they want to spend more money and help social services and uplift people who have challenges. Is that really progressive? <laughs> it just kind of makes sense. You know, I actually I appreciate you saying that, you know, yes, I'm absolutely unapologetically. I, I believe in, in lifting up people. I don't particularly care to win the award of being like the most left or the most progressive. I just want to win to get the changes done and lift people up and do things that make sense. I think a lot of the things that we want to do just make sense. Like we got this idea that, you know, in this pandemic, it's been hard on a lot of people. You know, it's not been hard on. It's not been hard on Amazon. It's not been hard on Netflix. It's not been hard on these massive companies. So shouldn't they pay their fair share? Shouldn't they be the ones that contribute more, those who profited more? Now, people are going to say that's a progressive way of thinking. I also think it just makes sense. Like it shouldn't be that small mom and pop shop that's forced to shut down that can't keep on operating that has to pay or it shouldn't be that family that lost their jobs and are struggling that has to pay. It should be the ones that can afford to pay. And, and that's, uh, that's how I try to approach it. What makes sense and how do we bring in a fair system that works for everybody? Jagmeet Singh, look him up on uh, social media. Thank you for your time today, man. It was a pleasure. Thanks, Jagmeet. It was an honor. I appreciate it yeah, very much. Yeah, congratulations on all your success you. up there and the moves you guys are making. Hey, we're going for it. My, my view is to be the next Prime Minister of Canada, so we keep on going to the top so we can fight for people. All right, we'll be talking to you soon, man. Take Appreciate care. It. Appreciate it. Take care. It. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you.